what are we going to talk about today? Um, going to talk about who is Metro. Um, I'm going to talk about the green construction policy and um, our other plans, uh, how our policy got developed, uh, the policy itself, uh, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, some implementation guidelines. I won't go through the details of the policy. Uh, we can reserve that at some point in conversation uh, during questions and answers, that kind of thing. And then we'll have some questions. Uh, who is Metro? Uh, in some areas I go to, uh, people think that I sell tickets, I have schedules with me and all that kind of stuff, but um, I don't, I don't, um, I, it, James. Could you uh, move your mic a little bit further? Further, it's a little too loud. So too loud. Yeah, you speak so loud. So yeah. All right, so I should probably, can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll probably just take this off mic off. Okay. So uh, who is Metro? Metro is a state chartered um, special jurisdiction. We're not part of the county, despite the county name. Uh, we are the uh, county's regional transportation planner. We are a regional builder uh, as well as a regional transit operator uh, for Los Angeles County. Uh, we also provide money uh, or, or dollars to the small, small uh, munis, as we call them, small bu uh, bus uh, operators. And we also work with Caltrans uh, on uh, different projects, like we build the sound walls. Uh, people have heard about the I-405 project. Uh, we build that for Caltrans. In our agency, we take a uh, comprehensive, uh, integrated cross-cutting approach uh, using environmental management system as uh, the integrating tool. Uh, EMS, for those who don't know what that is, that's essentially just jargon for um, uh, as a procedures of processes uh, based on uh, international standard to make sure that uh, all of our uh, uh, environmental compliance uh, uh, efforts are done in a very uniform way. I won't go through each one of these policies, but I just wanted to mention to you that uh, on, on the policies itself, uh, those policies, there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Those were created in the last uh, three years, two and a half to three years, uh, and with the exception of the first one, the very first one was uh, created in 2007. Uh, my group uh, wrote the rest of those policies there, and uh, for, for the rest of this talk, we'll talk about the green construction policy. And then as far as the plans are concerned, uh, the plans, uh, we develop those plans uh, and are, those are designed not only to reduce cost within our agency, um, we save about $2 million a year uh, based on, on our policies and our plans right now. Uh, and um, not only to reduce cost, but to reduce uh, human health and environmental impacts in all of our operations and all the things that we do. <coughs> and it's not moving, so let's do this. Uh, so I just want to go through this, uh, the quick timeline of how this policy, the green construction policy, was developed. Um, this policy was uh, essentially an offshoot of a board motion back in uh, December 2010 uh, by Director Katz, uh, O'Connor, and uh, Director Mark, Mark Lee Thomas. And from there on, um, in uh, uh, March of 2011, they presented our first policy. And the policy was very simple. We said that... Um, we're going to essentially clean the air through our construction efforts by doing maintenance, clean fuels, and then retrofit. And I almost got killed by the board. <laughs> so um, they said, go back to the drawing board, not acceptable, uh, consult with everybody. And uh, so for three months, I literally talked to hundreds of people, Neil and Morgan, <coughs> everybody in this basin. Uh, and we essentially held stakeholder meetings, and uh, we put the policy on the board, and we typed them up, and uh, what happened was, um, on af finally, after five months of all that hard work, uh, we essentially uh, had the board uh, adoption of the policy, and uh, last week, uh, we reported to the board uh, our progress on, on this policy. So what is this policy all about? This policy is contracts based. Uh, what that means is that I am not a police. My board member thought that I was going to hire hundreds of people to essentially uh, enforce this policy. Uh, what we're going to do here is that uh, when we uh, go out for bid for any project, uh, we're going to uh, ask uh, the contractor to essentially put together a list of uh, equipment that he's going to use. And he's going to certify it at the end of that list. And he's going to say, uh, well, I'm going to use these green construction equipment in my project. So we leave it, leave it up to him to essentially certify that. And during the, during the course of the project, uh, we're going to um, 
a check on those pieces of equipment if he's actually using those pieces of equipment. So that's how we're going to uh, enforce this. Uh, it draws from the best practices of other people, uh, like the Port of LA, Port of Long Beach, uh, and uh, some other jurisdictions across the nation. And uh, we have two types of projects here at the MTA. Uh, we have new construction and we have uh, existing projects. Uh, for Let me go to existing projects first. Existing projects, those are the ones that have not been um, inked, as we call it. Uh, there are no con the, the contracts, uh, uh, sorry, existing projects are the ones that have been inked, and they uh, are the ones that are ongoing. And the policy for those uh, projects will not be retroactive. Uh, we're going to encourage those individuals to essentially use reconstruction equipment. On the other hand, new construction, uh, the first one, first test case here is uh, the Crenshaw project. Uh, the Crenshaw project will use reconstruction equipment. The uh, uh, first pro uh, contract documents will be coming out at the end of this year. And uh, those will be um, required to use reconstruction equipment. Types of equipment, uh, we looked at on-road, off-road, and um, uh, generators. And um, as far as uh, the on-road piece of equipment, uh, we essentially say uh, incorporate the best available technology. Uh, we also have some idling prohibitions, uh, but those prohibitions are in accordance with uh, what the regulatory requirements require. And then there's a phasing period, uh, uh, wherein you know, we're only, only requiring certain types of retrofits uh, um, this year up to 2011, then there's another set until 2015, and then there's uh, another set of uh, uh, requirements for 2015 on. And that's for both uh, on-road and off-road equipment. Uh, for generators, uh, we would like uh, as much as possible for any uh, um, electricity uh, usage within the project to, uh, for the project to connect to existing source of power as much as possible, but if the um, a project uh, should require a generator to be used, then we uh, essentially require that a generator to meet certain requirements, and those are here on the, on the slide. There are certain exceptions, uh, and uh, there are uh, three common themes of these exceptions, and these include availability, or lack of availability, uh, funding, and duration of use. And I'll just go through this really quickly in the interest of time. And uh, essentially, on the uh, first, um, uh, the first bullet, as well as the third bullet in this list, uh, that's uh, in the uh, theme of availability. Uh, on the second bullet, that's in the theme of funding. And then on the fourth bullet here, equipment use, 10 days or less, uh, uh, that's in the theme of duration of use. Now, um, if the... Uh, contractor, I should say, is um, uh, exempted, or there's an exception, we essentially have a um, step-down menu. What this step-down menu means, uh, I won't go through the details of this, but what that means is that, for example, from 20, up to 2011, uh, the contractor is required uh, to do a compliance alternative number two, uh, which is, you know, there are three uh, engine standard and uh, level three car verified uh, uh, DCS. Uh, and he, if the contractor or the project is exempted uh, based on those uh, four items that I mentioned earlier, uh, then uh, they can go and into the compliance alternative three, and then so on and so forth. So, um, so in, in essence, what we're trying to say here is that although we have these current requirements, we have become very flexible in, uh, in our reconstruction policy so that economic uh, activity can still continue despite the fact that uh, the piece of equipment uh, may not necessarily be available at the point uh, that the construction is going. Uh, I won't go through each one of these, but I just wanted to give you a flavor that you know not only is the policy uh, requiring uh, engines uh, to be retrofitted or uh, certain generators to uh, essentially be uh, compliant with uh, requirements, uh, we've also incorporated some of these other items, uh, institutional, institu institutionalizing uh, mitigation measures that were developed during the CEQA process. Um, I already mentioned the contract based uh, enforcement. Um, we do it anyway, but we, institution we also put this in the policy. Uh, we notify sensitive receptors. Uh, we have regional, uh, a regional communication session to go out there and notify those uh, sensitive receptors anyway in any of our projects, but you know, uh, we mentioned this here. And then uh, we also have uh, records requirements prior to bid, and then uh, quantifying reporting on emissions reductions. 
Uh, I'm required by this policy to report back to our board within 18 months uh, of how our policy has uh, been implemented. And um, hopefully uh, we have been very successful and obviously with stakeholders like uh, AKMD, uh, uh, BDLA and other people, uh, uh, you will be able to uh, uh, claim that uh, we've been successful because of the regional partnership uh, in this region. Uh, some additional elements here, uh, comparison of CARB and MCA regulations, our policy is more strict uh, as far as off-road is concerned. Uh, regarding CARB uh, off-road, uh, they essentially uh, look at a uh, piece of equipment on average need to be clean. In our policy, it, every piece of equipment has to be clean. So um, uh, as far as generators are concerned, uh, we're uh, stricter than CARB uh, requirements, but you know, only as strict as AQMD regulations. And then as far as on-road, I should say, we're only as strict as the CARB uh, requirements. Uh, two things that we are all actually uh, making an emphasis on when we do our, our outreach, uh, and these are uh, the years 2015 and 2018 to 23. Uh, these are just trigger years wherein we uh, tell our uh, stakeholders, uh, especially the cities and special jurisdictions, that um, uh, federal requirements for new piece of construction equipment actually kick, kick in in 2015. So what we tell them is that um, uh, if we were, MTA is here to help. MTA is here as a resource. I would like to facilitate all these conversations across the basin. And if you need additional information, we're here to help out in this process in uh, the next four years so that when 2015 kicks in for new pieces of equipment, that all, at least you can look at the MTA and say, hey, you know, this is not as onerous of a requirement as it, as it is. Uh, and then card requirements, uh, that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, 2018 is when I guess all of these other regulations kick in for CARB. Uh, implementation efforts, uh, in the last uh, a few months, uh, we have been uh, going out uh, uh, and all out, I should say, in our implementation efforts. Uh, we are um, in the process of developing our specifications uh, and also incorporating all of the uh, reconstruction policy requirements into our procurement documents. Uh, we have been in consultation with cities and special jurisdictions uh, this is very important, and just want to mention here that the policy essentially bifurcates the implementation in this in this region. Uh, what that means is that um, um, the policy currently is applicable to MTA projects, and then projects that are are done on MTA property. We are working with the cities and special jurisdictions for the implementation of the same policy, uh, and we're helping them out through the, the resources that we have. Uh, in that uh, in that uh, conversation, and we hope to uh, implement this across the region, uh, hopefully in the next um, 18 months or less. Uh, we're also uh, working with CARB on enforcement training, uh, and then uh, we're uh, working with uh, our uh, other outreach uh, partners to essentially uh, help disseminate the information. You know, I'm I'm really uh, uh, gratified to be here today to essentially um, talk about our policy here. And then the last thing is, if you have any questions, uh, essentially, uh, that's my contact information. Uh, our website's there. There's a lot of chock full of information about uh, not only my programs, but also um, uh, the other programs at the MTA. And then that hotline number is a live number. Uh, Mr. Alvin Kusimoto is one of my staff. He actually answers the phone. Check. Check the message. Uh, he is the live person uh, at the other line of that, uh, of that phone number. So if you have any suggestions, any recommendations, anything that you want to talk about, environment, sustainability with the MTA, uh, feel free to um, uh, call that number. And also, sustainability at metro.net, sustainability at metro.net, that's the other uh, uh, place uh, that you can show, uh, send us information. Uh,